First of all, we just want to say thank you to you and welcome Annika thank Onora, you. who has come here to visit us here at Edge Hill today, has already been around on the golf buggy uh, at uh, whatever miles per hour that goes these days and has had a look around the campus. Um, we are so lucky to have Annika here with us today. She's very recently brought out her autobiography, My Hidden Race, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. But we're also going to talk about a few other things that uh, are raised by Annika's book, and we can hear about those too. So I've got a set of questions that I'm going to be asking. So for those of you who don't know a lot about Annika yet, um, her background is that uh, she was born to Nigerian parents and grew up in Liverpool, so is in fact a local lass. Um, she is or was a spring track and, uh, sprint track and field athlete. That was the word that I said I mustn't say wrong. I've just said it wrong. It's sprint, not spring. Uh, track and field athlete and has had significant successes in world championships, European championships and in the Olympics. So uh, we really do have a, a gold standard visitor here for, for uh, British, sorry, Black History Month. Um, this is our main event for this month. Um, hopefully this will be something that we can all look back on. It's being recorded today as well. So congratulations on your publication, My Hidden Race. Fantastic book. I've said to a number of people, I literally closed myself up in a room and read it for a whole day and, and, and didn't come out until I'd finished. Um, absolute commitment there. Um, I hear that it's also been long-listed for an award. This is the William Hill Sports Book of the Year yeah, award. Yeah, so congratulations is. on that. Thank you. How does that feel? Weird. Because <laughs> I'm like, who actually bought this book? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, honestly, it feels, it feels like such a prestigious honor to even be long listed because um, my understanding is the panel read around 150, 200 books, Amazing. sports books, and mine made the top 15. That, um, that have been released in the past 12 months and um, I'll find out in two weeks. No, I'll find out next week if it's been shortlisted. So next week? Yeah, so okay. the 27th, so the day before my birthday. Oh my goodness. Okay, so we're going to be crossing <laughs> our fingers for you for next week. Yeah. Um, I did have a look at the long list. Okay. Uh, and out of that 15 books, mm -hmm. those sports writers, only three of those were women, which I thought was rather unusual. But you are, obviously, you're one of those. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think is going on there? Is it that we're not getting enough female sports writers? or I think there's a lot of female sports writers. I actually know quite a few. A few at some national newspapers and um, ones that are just, you know, writing about general sports in, in general. But, um, yeah, it, it would be nice to, for us to get more recognition. Yeah. I don't know, actually. I should, I should find out from... Uh, Publishers, if anyone, if a woman's actually won it in the past, that would be good to know. Uh, imagine if I was the first. That'd be incredible. Oh my gosh! We will rejoice with you. You know, I'd have a party. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that birthday party and. Well, I'm already going to Vegas, so. <gasps> oh my word! <laughs> Maybe on top when I get back. We'll keep our eye on social media for that one, shall we? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about your book. We, it's called My Hidden Race. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we'd be interested to know why you chose that title and what was it that really inspired you to write the book? Yeah, so great question to kick off. Mm. Um, the title came from um, a friend of mine. It was actually me and him. We co-created it together. So during the process of writing the book, I had a small group of people, close friends and close family who um, were aware that I was writing the book. So. For anyone who's read it, there's a lot of, you know, there's some heavy stuff in there. So sometimes I would need to offload to certain people um, and they were always there. So whether I was sending them, you know, voice notes at like two, three o'clock in the morning or whether I was just, you know, just kind of upset about stuff or whether I just needed someone to reminisce about a really funny moment, like getting stuck in the lift in the Olympics or something crazy like yeah. that. Um, they were always there for me and then one of them in particular he's he was just incredible so we were brainstorming about words and like the context of the book and all of these different things and then I was like well I've got a podcast called Hidden Greatness and so we, we sort of drawed off that and then um, when we look at the race aspect it's like you're racing on the track um, you're racing for your life you're racing for excellence um, so yeah, it's hidden in the sense that I was going through a lot that I didn't tell anyone and um, racing on the track, so yeah. 
And that's what we find out in the book. We find yeah. Out there was a lot that you were going through mm -hmm. personally um, in a professional context um, that you kept to yourself. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of years, that was stuff that people didn't know. And you felt that it was time to do that. What, why now? Why do you think? Um, I think mainly because I retired. <laughs> it's, I know it's very cliche, but it's very easy. It's a lot easier to talk about things when you've left um, the sport or organisation or whatever. So it was a lot easier for me to just kind of walk away from it and just kind of, you know, tell my story. Um, and it came about, the book came about because one of the, um, one of the, what do you call them? <laughs> Why can't I talk right now? <laughs> Don McRae. He, um, he, he, was, he interviewed me, he's, he's a, one of the most fantastic journalists from The Guardian, and he, um, he a quote, that's the word I was looking for, a quote, he gave me a quote for the book, but I wouldn't have done it without his help and his support, so he, he wrote a piece on The Guardian in 2017, when I was um, in the Bahamas for a championship, I wasn't on holiday, but I was there for a championship, and we did an interview, because I hadn't told anyone I contracted malaria, and... Um, Don was like, I want to be the person to write the story. And because we were on the phone, we wasn't on mobiles. <clears throat> the, we were on the hotel phone and it kept cutting out like about four or five times. And I'm thinking, this isn't going to work. He's not going to get what he needs to, you know, get up across in the story. And then it was printed two days later. And then I was in Florida and my phone, my phone just blew up because everyone read the article. And when I read it, everything was exactly what, how I wanted it to look. Um, and then Don, afterwards, he was like, you know, I can tell there's a lot more about you. And when you're ready to tell your story, I'm here. So then when I retired, I was like, hi, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then, um, yeah, we, we started, you know, thinking of, like, okay, what, what's going to make the story impactful? Um, what's going to separate it from all the other sports books? And I think I've done that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I think your, your voice really does come across very clearly. It really feels as if it's come from you. So I, this is the second time I've met you now, and it, do, it really does, it feels like it's your words. Um, but sometimes we need that extra person to cast their eye over it, yeah, don't we, yeah, to, to, to make it as it should be. So there is a dedication at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. um, which I believe is in Igbo, which yes. is the Nigerian language, yes, yeah. that your, your parents speak. What does it mean? Um, it was from my... It's from my mum and dad, so it was, so it was just basically saying, um, like... We're just excited, we're happy, you know, um, you know, religion, Christianity plays a lot into family life, like Nigerian culture. So talking about God and just the impact that he's had on your life. My parents would always pray for me all the time. So yeah, it's just that and a dedication to like my dad just saying how amazing he was and I hope he's proud of me. Because when you open books and you see like um, a dedication, because my publishers asked me, Did you want, do you want to write one? And I was like, mm, I don't know what to say. But when, I, when I'd read so many, done loads of research and read books in the past, sometimes I'd see like, oh, to my darling wife or to my dog or cat or whatever. Um, I'm, even though the book is in English, I wanted to write something that kind of brings my culture and heritage to life. So, yeah, it's hopefully everyone will understand it. If not, Google it. <laughs> Google Translate, yeah. yeah. So that is a very important part to who you are, um, your Nigerian heritage. You grew up um, in a community where there were lot, lots of others. Um, you were spending time eating together, dancing together, celebrating together. What, what, does, what difference does it make to you having that heritage? It was so important, I think, growing up. Um, it's like, you know, when you're growing up in, in a city like Liverpool where it's just a melting pot of different people, it's amazing that you've got so many different cultures. So when I was at school, you'd have like traditional British upbringing when you're outside the house. But then when you're at home, you have, you know, a mixture of the English culture, but also the Nigerian culture as well. You know, learning to speak Igbo. Don't ask me to speak it now. <laughs> um, but yeah, growing up, that was things that we do. You know, learning about the material, the cloth, um, the clothing that we wear. And when we go to hall parties, um, seeing kids and you know adults and um, learn about the music learn about the history just all of it it was so important and I think it played such a huge part in in growing up and um, even to this day you know when you see when you just think oh Nigerians are everywhere we truly are so I was in Boston the other day and 
I, I came out the hotel and this lady was like, oh, I've seen your face somewhere. Obviously, I'm not going to tell her that I was an athlete. <laughs> I don't know where she saw me. And then she was out. And then I told her about, like, oh, I was an athlete. And she said, she heard about the book because she saw my face. And then um, she said, oh, I believe you're Nigerian. I was like, yeah. She's like, oh, I'm Nigerian too. So, you know, and that was in the middle of Boston. It's not like, you know, just the most random place ever. So, yeah, like, it's, it's amazing. It's like having that really strong connection to um, just kind of understanding each other's traditions and cultures. So to sort of get to some of the um, darker parts of the book, um, you write very frankly about the sexual assaults that you endured from a physiotherapist. Um, and that was, I think, is that in your late teens and your early 20s that yes. that took place? Um, what made you want to write about that? I mean, that this is it's quite hard reading. Um, and certainly for anybody who's experienced something like that, it's an incredibly traumatic thing. And so and I would imagine you had to sort of relive some of that trauma by writing it down. So what was it that inspired you to, to get that down onto paper? Um, I think there was just different things. You know, I, when you've, for anyone who's ever gone through any sort of sexual assault or sexual trauma or any sort of trauma, and it's, you're not open about it, it's really hard to talk about it. You know, prior to me writing the specifics of um, what happened, I hadn't told anyone. And, you know, a lot of fear that I felt like I was going to be dealing with um, through the process of writing the book, even beforehand, you know, kind of living with that for so many years. And then you, you read different cases now when it comes to women who've gone through sexual assault and you just think, well, people ask questions, are they going to be believed? And... You know, what were you doing to make this happen? But from a sporting perspective, it's become so prominent now in, case, in, in terms of what's happening now in gymnastics, in, especially with Larry Nassar, um, the, the US gymnastics doctor, um, and other cases globally as well. So things don't happen. Just because it happens abroad, it doesn't mean to say that it's not happening here. And also, people are actually going through so many traumatic experiences that, you don't feel brave enough to speak about, but I just felt like I had to put that in the book. It's so important that you did that. And I think you're right when we think about um, the various kind of movements like the Me Too movement, yeah. um, the way that some people have been brave enough to speak openly and to um, put the hashtag onto Twitter and these sorts of things. Um, we might think that it's only them. It only happens to them maybe in another country or in another industry. But to, f to know that it, has, it happens in Britain happens to people in the industries that we're involved in, I think that's a really important thing. So in a, in a similar sort of way, um, you, you, you talked in the book about um, getting mental health support. Now, no matter what anyone's career is, they're going to potentially need some mental health support. Um, but you're saying that there were, there were no mental health supporters from a diverse background. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about that. We've actually got a PhD student here at Edge Hill who's looking at, I don't know if she's here today, um, is looking at um, black British Caribbean counsellors, um, that there are so few of them, so black British people are finding it very hard to find a counsellor who can perhaps understand their lived experience. Um, so we know that that is a, is a very important thing. Can you expand on why that might be important in British athletics? I think... I think the main focus is that, you know, you, sometimes you're dealing with individuals um, who don't necessarily look like you. So if you're a therapist and you are speaking to a patient who's an athlete who has just been pulled over by the police or racially discriminated, that's something that you personally can't relate to. So then you might say, well, you know, are you sure this happens? And, you know, do you want to elaborate more? Because I don't really understand what you're saying. And so there's gaslighting and then it gets downplayed and, you know, that's something that you can't relate to because you've never been able to experience that. So when I talk about, you know, the therapist that we had, part of the women's 4 by one team, and, you know, she asked that awful question. Um, if you haven't read it, it's in the book. <laughs> um, I was just so flabbergasted because, you know, why would you ask that question? What, what put you in a very comfortable position to think that was okay to ask. Um, and yeah, I never saw her again after that, and I don't think many of the other girls did neither, but it was just so important for us back then to have, and even now, 
to have therapists um, who, who look like you, who can relate to you, have a better understanding. And also as well, for, for white therapists, I've got a white therapist, like shout out Donovan, he's amazing. So I, I'm able to teach him about my culture, my heritage, things that he might not know about. Um, and there's nothing wrong with him or anyone else who works in the industry to so just kind of learn that and just understand the impact that it would have, just learning about race, identity, and you know, things like discrimination. And allowing you to speak from your perspective, where you're at, without question. Yes. Um, which is, I think that was the position that you were kind of put in. Uh -huh. So that's good. If you ask that, if, if, you, if you see therapy as being an ongoing thing, um, you continue to have therapy now as the oh, years gosh, go yeah. by. <laughs> I need it more than ever. <laughs> no, therapy is so important. I think um, there's a lot of stigma that... I think it still comes with therapy. Um, I think as, a, as someone who's, you know, been in the public eye, and also been front and centre in, in, you know, in a global sport for you know, almost two decades, it was important for me to manage my mental health and not have it done solely on my own. So having a, a team of people around me, um, but also thinking, not thinking of the end goal, which is you know, to win the race, because sometimes you don't always win races that you want to win. It's always about learning from that, but also not beating yourself up about it along the way. So. Yeah, he was amazing during those moments, especially just having an impact on my whole career. Thank you for that. Um, thinking about uh, British athletics again, um, there's a, a section in the book where you, you make some quite incredible comments, and I'm going to literally just read out a little quotation of something that you said. This is about the executive level mm -hmm. of British athletics, and you write, the track was dominated by black British athletes, but the boardroom was filled with white men in well-tailored suits. So not only is that a really beautifully written sentence, <laughs> I just like that. You get an A star for that one. Um, but it says something about the management of British athletics, doesn't it? Um, is that still the case today? How far do we have to go? Um, it, is it still the case? Kind of, yes and no. So no in the sense that since 2012, um, I think British athletics realise they need more black people of colour to be front and centre in team management positions, senior positions. And unfortunately, it took the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor passing, or being murdered rather, to um, realise that, OK, well, black people do exist and, you know, they do understand how to have these positions of power. Let's give them the opportunity. So, yes, that was the case. So Christian Malcolm being given the head coach or Olympic coach but unfortunately, he was let go last month, um, and they, wa they wanted to go in a new direction, whatever that means. Take that however you wish. Um, but with, with Christian, working alongside Christian was Paula Dunn, who I also talk about in the book, and just realising how much of an impact she had on me from such a young age. So, you know, going to train in Manchester and seeing Paula, um, she had a, a coach's job, and she had, like, a... She was like head of performance within the Northwest, and then she's worked her way up through the rankings. And over the years, she was head of uh, the Paralympic pa the para team, para Olympic team for Great Britain. Whereas now she's moved on to the Olympic team for Great Britain, so she works on the performance. So having her there, I wish I had Paula there because you know she was para at the time; she wasn't Olympic side. So I wish I had her, and um, because it, it would have made a huge amount of difference, but. I'm hoping now that the athletes on the team will understand that the impact that Paula makes. But also, I hope British athletics recognise that it can't just be like a tip box exercise and it has to be an ongoing process. Is it something that you'd move into, do you think? Would you think of moving into the executive level? I actually tried. <laughs> so um, I applied for a non-executive director role last year, no, 18 months ago and I didn't get the, the position. And then they contacted me a year ago um, for the same position. And, and, and originally I said no, because I just, to be honest, I didn't have the time. <laughs> I didn't have the time. But then they said, oh, well, can, can we put your CV f forward anyway? And I was like, oh, do whatever you want. Like, yeah. it's fine. And then I got a call back for the interview the week later. So I, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm here now. Let me just do the interview. And because I wanted, because I'd been 
Um, I actually did a course during lockdown with the FA, so to learn about corporate governance, because I actually want to sit on boards. Um, and having this interview, regardless of how it went, was a great opportunity. So even though I didn't get the role, I want to learn more about what goes on behind, behind the scenes, not just within sports, but also in business as well. So it was great experience into yeah. that role as well yeah. and oh. make a difference for and the good thing is there are women who look like me who now sit on the board mm -hmm. so yeah it's not just the same stale pale white men it's encouraging it's yes, encouraging it to is. hear that really good um so you mentioned earlier on about um some of the the deaths that have happened um often at the hands of um those who are meant to be protecting us thinking of george floyd and others um what do you think that we in britain can learn about um, from, from this, from the Black Lives Matter movement, from the deaths of people like Stephen Lawrence, because you mentioned the British deaths um, that we know, so Stephen Lawrence, Anthony Walker in the UK. Um, what, what would you say we, we need to know, what do we need to do to see a fairer country? Um, I'd say don't, turn, don't necessarily turn a blind eye to it or just think it's just an American problem. Because everyone seems to think it's an American problem, um, and it's not our problem. Whereas just last month, Chris Carver was killed at the hands of the police, and there was another black gentleman who was tasered by the Thames in London at the hands of the police. So it, it, it's ongoing. You know, it's not. It's an ongoing situation. I don't know if it's. I would. I would love to see it end and finish. I don't know if that's the case because black people are being killed at the hands of the police and it's, it is quite scary. We are in 2022 and think, well, people think, oh, well, it'll never happen to me, it'll never happen to me. And I'm sure Chris Carver had that thought and then, you know, he was, he was killed, you know, in his car by the, at the hands of the police. And um, it's always, and there's always a stigma that comes with it. So people always ask the questions, well, what did he do? What? you know, what weapons did he have in his car? Was he carrying drugs? All of those things. And then, because it's printed in the national news, people assume that he must be in a gang or it's drug related or whatever, whereas he might have just been a regular person who, you know, unfortunately was killed at the hands of, the, of you know, people who were supposed to protect us. Um, I think it, it definitely involves a lot of people just having an understanding, like read books, um, ask questions to others around you. Don't just turn a blind eye to it because that's not, that's not us moving on. You, you can't, I'm not in a position, I'm not in a privileged position where I can, you know, just brush it under the carpet. I'm not in that because I, I live and breathe that. Like, that could happen to me, me getting killed by the police, God forbid, but, you know, things like that could happen purely based off your skin colour. So I think as a society, we definitely need to do better and not, you know, kind of create this... It's not about like a race war, you, you know, between them and us. It's about us, people understanding that this, this does happen in community. It does happen in British society and just to be a lot more aware of it. And even locally, because you write about it in your book with your, your father being stopped in yes. the car. Yes. Um, so you know from first-hand experience that it, this can come out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, even I was, I don't know why, I was so gobby, 15-year-old at, at that point, or 16, 16 17-year-old. But I, I just remember looking at the police officer, and you know when you're standing there, you see police officers, they're just, you know, they've got all the weapons and they've got all this. But I think I was just more angry because I'm like, mate, I'm trying to get home, I've got an exam tomorrow. Like, why are you stopping me, Dad, for? Um, and he was, my dad was taken aback from it, the police officer was, because I, I literally was just asking, you know, why are you stopping us? Is it a reason for you? Do you have a search warrant? No? Okay. Let's keep it moving then. And it, it was me kind of trying to defuse the situation, but understanding that, you know, you, you basically stop my dad because he's black. He doesn't drink. He, drugs is like, no. Like, why have you stopped him? Um, and it just felt like they were just playing games and it just felt like it was an opportunity to target us. Um, so yeah, trauma. That, uh, you found out that this wasn't the first time. Is that right? That, that your, your parents had been basically keeping that from you, that they'd had these yeah. experiences? Yeah, my dad had been stopped a few times and um, he actually told me as well, you know, after that incident, you know, I don't want to see you in a body bag and, you know, I don't want anything to happen to you. So when you get stopped, over, when you get pulled over by the police, just stop and comply. That was always it. 
And I never really understood what he meant after then, after that, up until I moved to London. So I moved to London between 2008 and 2012, and I was stopped countless times. Just, yeah, stopped. I wasn't even driving any of Flash. <laughs> it was just like a And every time I was stopped, it was just like, hello, officer, how are you? And he's like, do you know why you've pulled, pulled you over? No. Do you mind explaining to me why you pulled me over? But it's not a case of you being smart or sarcastic or being angry, because at any point they could just draw the weapon and then that's you. And this is the days before you know, we, we had access to be able to record everything instantly, you know, so quite scary, I would say. What an experience for you. Um, so let's move on to a slightly lighter matter. Um, you will have no doubt um, as you mentioned earlier, you've done lots of research, you've read lots of books in preparation for this book. But are there any books or authors that have really inspired you? Books or, or, or people who have really sort of lit the way for you, held a torch? Good question. Um, there was a couple of books. So in terms of inspiration for writing My Hidden Race, um, Andre Agassi, so I was a huge tennis fan. I still am, was, I still am a huge tennis fan. I just love tennis. Um, and Andre Agassi's book is just, yeah, it's a masterpiece because it's not, it's, it's not like a normal sports book. He, he went through so much, like he hated tennis. Um, he didn't always enjoy it. Obviously he was like the world's best, but in the beginning he was just kind of pushed. It was more of his father's dream than it was Andre's. So you learn about that, you learn about like how he had a drinking problem, how he um, was taking drugs as well and somehow managed to pass that. And there was a big, and because it happened years prior to when the book was released, that went like, like just lit a fuse in how WADA and everyone, all the other doping, um, doping management agencies operate because it was like, how was Andre Agassi able to get away with this? And he's basically telling on himself. <laughs> But he gave a reason as to what happened. Um, so his book was just phenomenal. Um, I think, who's else? Serena Williams, because she's like an icon. Tennis? Yes, tennis, yeah, tennis is, ten, there's a couple of icons in tennis. Um, I love Michelle Obama's book, Becoming, that was really good. So like I mentioned to you earlier, when I was sitting with the team and trying to get an idea of the cover, um, I wanted the look to be just me, but timeless and like picking up the book in 20, 30 years time and just hope, hopefully I haven't aged too much. <laughs> hopefully. Um, yeah, and there's, there's a whole bunch of books as well. There's, there's ones that I grew up on, but I, I read different genres, but I, I really like audio books as well. I really love reading audio books. Um, some light-hearted ones. There's one that I'm... Ugh, he's, he's funny. It, this is, like, completely left, but only because I, I really actually like him. So you know the presenter, Rylan? Anyone know Rylan? Yeah. So Rylan, he's, his book, um, he released it. It's called Ten. So his, his one is um, quite funny. I'm listening to that now. That's a definite to put on my list, I think. <laughs> I, I, I definitely want to see that. Yeah. Books, but, yeah. How about films? What sort of films have made an impression upon you? Um, gosh, so many, so many films. I like um, biopics. I love, love biopics. So I recently watched Elvis's biopic. His one was quite interesting because I didn't really know that much about Elvis. Um, so yeah, just kind of learning about that. And I always do research and think, well, who's involved? You know, because there's so many biopics about someone who's, you know, been such a global icon, whether it's Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, someone like, I don't know, John Paul, the Pope, um, who in their inner circle had access to all this information. Is it correct? Is it, you know, fact, fiction, all of that stuff? So how accurate is it? So I really, really love, like, biopics. And sometimes, again, for lightheartedness, Disney movies. Oh, well, we <laughs> that's, that's absolutely definite. Disney Plus, what an amazing channel. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Annika. Those are the questions that um, I wanted to ask you today. So we're going to um, ask a couple of people who have already let us know what their questions are, and we're going to ask them to uh, grab a microphone. The microphone will be brought along to you. And I believe the first, first person is Akosa, who is the Edge Hill 
Black, Asian, minority, ethnic officer. Ah, there you are. Question, um, what motivated me? I, one thing I always say is I was never motivated by money in sport because money in track and field is not like football at all. It's very much the opposite. Um, I think I was motivated just because I wanted to see how far I could push myself. Like I, I knew I was talented, but I didn't know how talented I was, especially making that transition from junior level to senior level. There's a lot that can happen. So if you look at the, you know, like the, you know, there's this big discussion, ongoing discussion about the dropout rate, especially with girls between the age of 16 to 18. So what happens, a lot can happen in that time. You know, you just, you just find other interests, you know, your body changes. You just think, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Whereas I just always stuck by it. Um, I wanted to see how far I could go. Um, and then once you start winning medals as well, it's like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> I want a bit more of this. But again, there's no, it's, it's not a straight line by any means. It's just con continuous of, you know, having injury and then making finals and then running championships and then having a dip as well. So um, thankfully, the last few years of my career it was just really, really successful and consistent, which I really enjoyed. But I also put my body through a lot in order to get there. Um, so I would say talent, being excellent or trying to, you know, show some form of excellence, but also having fun because, yeah, then I had to step into the big bad world of normal life. So, yeah. Are you still running for pleasure as well? Um, no. <laughs> I did go to the track before. It's great. It looks really great. It's very well kept as well. I do like it. Um, so I do, I do go to the gym, so I like going and doing strength and conditioning exercises and routines. Um, but I don't enjoy working out by myself, so I have to join like group sessions because it's so easy for people. I get it now. I get it when people who... Um, where, you've either got it or you haven't. Like When I did it, I had to do it because I was accountable for myself. No one was going to do it for me. Whereas now, imagine running like 500 metres but then deciding, oh, I want to stop. I don't want to do this anymore. So now I, I join group sessions or I have someone along with me to like do a workout and it's so much easier. Yeah. More sociable. Yeah, <laughs> makes it, yeah. Um, okay, so do you ha did you have a second question? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask um, what motivated you as a black female athlete and what advice would you give to young people who are inspired by you? What advice? I know it's, again, very cliche, but it is generally about just having fun. So even despite everything that I went through, I always looked at the fun side to it. Like, what motivates you to get up every morning? And it was because I loved it. I had such a thrill, such a joy. It wasn't always about winning medals. Um, yes, it was about being one of the best athletes in the world, and it always came at a cost. There was always a constant sacrifice, but I really did enjoy the journey and I had so much fun along the way. So I would say like, have fun. And the minute it stops being fun, that's when you stop and move on to something else that you might not even know you've got a second talent in. Yeah, take, take the leap, have a go. Um, I believe we also have Maz Vita. Is Maz Vita around? There you are. Okay, so I just want to say a word about Masvita because I've heard that she was part of the My Icon project. Is that right? You were part of that. So this, so I don't know if you, you saw any of these big posters around the campus when you were travelling about, um, but this was a project for Black History Month and a number of students were selecting their icons to put onto this sort of full-sized poster. They researched it themselves uh, and that then went up onto the posters. One in my building for Bell Hooks. Um, was yours Dame Linda Dobbs, is that right? Yeah. That was your one. Um, so congratulations on that, and thank you that to, for being part of that project. Would you like to ask a couple of questions? Um, yeah. I want to ask them, um, do you ever think it's too late to be a professional athlete? Or do you think it's like a peak age, like 21 or like 25? Referring to me or yourself? <laughs> oh, um, how old are you, sorry? Oh, you're super young. <laughs> I thought you were talking about me, because I've passed it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm good. Like, honestly, I can watch you from there. Um, but, yeah, I think for you, yeah, there's never, there's never, it's never too late. Um, I don't know if you guys, well, some of you are super young. What is it, Gen Z? Gen Z? What, I was going to say, some of them might not know who Linford oh, Christie was. Say, yeah. yeah. I haven't got a clue. I okay. don't know which generation is which. But I, I'm, I'm not sure which year group are you from? Year 11. Year 11. So year 11. And then the students that we've got here will be between 18 and 21 usually. And the okay. staff I won't mention. <laughs> well, Linford Christie, for those of you who do know him, if you don't know who Linford Christie is, Google him. Um, he's uh, one of Britain's best sporting track and fields athletes ever. And he didn't start athletics until he was... He didn't get good until he was, like, mid-20s. Um, he, I think he started the sport when he was, like, tw 19, maybe 20, early, early 20s. And then he didn't peak until he was late 20s, early 30s. So, yeah, if, you, if, you, if it's something that you really want to do, at the very least, give yourself an opportunity because you don't know what's going to happen if you don't... Like, like we were saying, just take that leap of faith. And if you need help, then feel free to contact me. <laughs> do you have a second question, Rodrigo? Do you have a, a second? Yeah, okay. Um, what other sport would you play as a professional if you didn't play athletics? Oh, um, tennis, probably, first one. Um, I don't know how my knees would take it, though, because I've got really bad knees. Um, Basketball. I really like basketball. I don't have an NBA team. I just like all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, probably basketball. And I really loved following the Olympics last year. So it was the first Olympics I watched in Tokyo that I wasn't part of. So it was actually nice to watch the games. And I just... What's the new one? Uh, rock climbing or climbing? So that one. Oh, my word. Those guys can move. Yeah, they can shift up those up the um, rock. So, um, yeah, I really, really loved that. I don't know if I'd try it because I don't know if I'd a little bit scared of heights, but um, it looks it looks fun. So, if I could pick any of those other ones, then yeah. You're welcome. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so this is our, your chance. Um, if you're sitting there and you've been you've got a burning question that you would like to ask to Anika, this is your chance. We have our roving mic, so all you have to do is. Wave your hand in the air, and we'll get the microphone to you. Is everyone being shy? Yeah, they're all very <laughs> There's some discussion going on in the seats back there of um, you ask it, no, you ask it. Do you have a question? Yeah. Go on, then. The microphone's coming over. Hold on. When you wrote the book, like, mm -hmm. What influence did you want to get out there? Like, what did you want to put out there to those people? Oh, um, that my story is real and that anyone can read any part of the chapter in the book and relate to it. So whether it's assault, whether it's racism, discrimination, uh, abuse, mental health, um, missing training to go and see Jamiroquai in concert... <laughs> Um, anything like that, but you know, there's there's a lot of deep, dark stuff in the book. But it's I also went through some really good moments as well. So um, hopefully, people who've read it are able to get a laugh out of some parts as well. So yeah, just being able to do that. But but like reading it, like you you don't have to know me. You don't have to know about my story, my career, my sport and achievements to read that book. It's I didn't want the book to just be around sports, um, because there's a lot of sports authors who put books out, and you can be, you know, a global superstar, and you can write about, you know, your sessions and um, how, how great they were, but that might not also be relatable, because people might, might know stuff like that. So talking about what goes on in the Olympic Games, I went to three Olympic Games, there's, there's a lot that goes on in the village, that people don't talk about. So, you know, a lot. <laughs> um, so just talking about that, so that's, what I'm, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to put across and hopefully I feel like I've done a good job of getting that balance in the book. So, have you read it yourself? No. Okay, well, this, now's a great opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another, is that, is that a hand over at the back, Sarah? 
Hi, Annika. Um, just a question for myself. Having read the book, um, there's a part of it where you mention about not seeing visual representation of yourself, or not particularly yourself, but of black athletes. Do you think that's now been addressed? Has there been a change, or is it still sort of a, a progressive like movement? I definitely think it's been progressive, um, as slow as it was, I think. Just, yeah, you know, I, I, again, something I mentioned in the book, you know, um, coming into my place of work, I didn't always feel safe. And having those pictures up there of people who don't look like me, I don't think was a great idea. I don't think it was a great choice. And it also, when you put into perspective, it doesn't reflect Great Britain as a whole. It doesn't reflect Great Britain as a whole. It definitely wasn't a reflection of the Great Britain track and field team. So... Had I not said anything to the powers that be, it, you probably would have had the same faces up there. Um, but I'm all for having those uncomfortable conversations with the people who need to hear it, even if it means shaking the table. Because if I'm feeling the way I am, imagine what another black athlete is feeling like. Um, and again, it, it was I felt like it was a duty responsibility for me as a senior athlete at the time to speak about it and be open and kind of deal with the consequences wherever they may land. But thankfully it worked out in the end. But um, yeah, I would love to see more. And I think we are starting to see more, even, you know, growing up, you know, reading, you know, magazines like Big and Smash Hits and uh, Cosmopolitan and Just 17. I didn't see girls who look like me on the front cover, on the inside. I didn't see that. So I always had to get family members to send me those same magazines from the US, so I had to have their versions because those are the girls who look like me, so that wasn't a reflection of me, the British ones, whereas now we're seeing a lot more, whether it's Vogue, whether it's Cosmopolitan, um, running magazines, we are seeing a lot of it, and we're seeing a lot more black um, sportswomen as well doing campaigns, which I love, so yeah, hopefully change is coming, slow, but it's coming. Another question at the back there. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, my question is about kind of the response that you've had from um, either current or retired athletes from your book and how have, if they've read it, how have they received it and kind of like, yeah, what's been the response from athletes relating to maybe the experiences that you've um, dealt with? Yeah, um, a lot of them have who are still good friends or even if they're not friends with me they'll they've reached out and they've just been just I've just been blown away by the response um I've been extremely positive um a lot of them are like why aren't I in the book <laughs> so a lot of people wanted you know their moments to claim to fame and stuff like that but um you know I can only put this what is it 69,000 words in the book that was the limit I couldn't go over but yeah, they've they've loved it. They've really enjoyed um, reading it. Um, some of the stuff, obviously, you know, the assault and all the other things that I was going through, the, the deep stuff, a lot of them weren't aware of it. So it was hard for them to kind of grasp because I was around them all the time or around them at team events, warm weather camps, and they didn't... The fact that I was going through so much and they weren't aware of it, I think, I think they... I've just been so supportive, really. They really have been supportive and they've been sharing it with other people, sharing it on social media um, and just, yeah, just, just enjoying the fact that, you know, someone's representing the sport and it's not all like the British public think it to be. Um, it's, a t it's a story about my life from a different perspective, which is what I wanted to do. And yeah, everyone has enjoyed it. I don't think I've had any negative feedback. I don't think so. Might be one or two, but I don't care. <laughs> That's <a spirit>. <laughs> <laughs> we had a question over here, I think, didn't we? And there's some a chap just in the second row. Um, when did you realise you wanted to do athletics? Oh, um, probably, probably during, probably growing up watching the Olympics. So watching the likes of Linford Christie, Tessa Sanderson. Um, Denise Lewis, watching all these great British icons um, and, and just realising, wow, the Olympics looks so much fun. You know, it happens every four years. Um, 
and but I didn't know at the time how good I was. So kind of seeing all these, you know, British icons and just realizing how much of an impact they have on me. And then during school sports day, where I was just smashing it in the sprints. Um, and I only ever wanted my moment of glory during sports day, and then I would go back to my academics. I wasn't bothered about taking it up after school. Um, and then I was scouted by one of the local coaches at, during that sports day event. And he asked me to come along and I was, I was shy. I, I didn't really, I went to all girls school, so I wasn't interested in making friends outside. And then I decided to go down to the track and the next day and the rest was history. So yeah, and that was when I was 15, 16. Yeah, around that time. So yeah, and that, thankfully I'm glad I never stopped, you know, even with the injuries or kind of understanding the sport. It, there's a lot that comes with it. It's not just about you having a goal. It also teaches you about accountability, how to collaborate with others around you. So, you know, how to be sociable with other people. It teaches you about time management, dis how to be disciplined, whether it's, um, you know, getting to training on time, having the right foods, how much rest and recovery you're getting, um, how to manage other people and their expectations, but all the your expectations. So, in all honesty, it kind of sets you up for what's to come in the future, whether it's sport worked out or not. So, yeah, I'm glad I stuck it out. In fact, from what I remember in the book, he had to really persuade you to go along. <laughs> Didn't he come back several times? Yeah, saying... he did. He did. He asked me, I think he, he started asking me when I was like 14, and I was like, no. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to. And then he asked me again. Um, he came down to one of our PE lessons because he was also a PE teacher as well. So he saw me, he was like, you're going to cut? No. And then during, um, when I was 15, during sports day, I just remember having a whole bunch of trophies and medals and passing them on to my mom. And then I seen him talking to my mom and then he came over and then he was like, are you going to join? Are you going to join the Harriers? And then it was my friends who encouraged me as well. So I had really, really good school friends. And they were like, oh, Annika, for God's sake, just join. <laughs> <laughs> they were just so angry and they could tell how talented I was as well. So, yeah. yeah. Have you been back to the Harriers? Uh, yes, I have. I have. I have been back. Um, I don't go often, but I do, I do love going back. It always, always brought back so many memories. And even when I was away from home, I'd always come home for Christmas and I no longer had to jump over the fence because the track was always closed <laughs> during Christmas. So, because they're like friends now, they just give me a key. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, so they gave me a key. So, I was, they were like, yeah, just lock up when you're done. So, yeah, that was always nice. Because I, I had to keep training over Christmas. It wasn't like just rest. So, yeah. every uh, alternative day. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. We still have time for a couple more questions. We've got any hands. Let me just check my watch. Yeah. Oh, we have a hand. Hi, Nika. Hi. How do you manage your nerves when you, at, the, at the point of uh, being at a big race, a big event, the, the build up to that event? Oh, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, how do I manage it? I think I would probably say my psychologist always played such a huge part in kind of managing nerves, managing expectations. Um, we would probably just visualize he would teach me how to visualize the race so I would always visualize how it would go so it wasn't me looking at film or footage but I would get a sense of how it would feel when I'm in great great shape everything just flows <clears throat> excuse me everything just flows so nicely um and then I would visualize what it was I wanted to do so running the 400 is a lot longer than running the 200 so you kind of just, you, you break it up into sections to make it easier as opposed to just thinking, okay, 390, 380, you know, 399, 397, it doesn't work like that. So just visualising the race itself and looking for good distractions because sometimes it can be overwhelming to visualise the same race repeatedly because a lot can go wrong. You're trying to prevent things and eliminate things from going wrong, but some things can happen where something can throw you off or someone runs in your lane, whether it's an individual or, or a relay, a lot can happen. So I would, he would always tell me to look for good distractions. So he would always say, 
I don't, want, I don't want you to sit there the day before your race and watch 10 hours on Netflix. I want you to do something with your hands. Like, you, I don't want you to activate your body, but do something with your hands. So he would say, like, write. I want you to start writing, whatever it was. Um, and I'd be like, I don't want to write, because that involves thinking. And he'd be like, OK. I'd, he'd, get, he'd say, get a, a colouring book. So basic. But you get to look at, like, pretty designs, and you can get adult colouring books as well. Um, and yeah, just, just kind of doing that or playing, um, what did I used to have? Not like a Game Boy, a PSP, is a PSP, like a handheld device. Sometimes I used to have that often as well. So I don't think I'm very good at it. <laughs> That's why I, I buy everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, just looking for good distractions. So like Tom Daly at the Olympics last year, he was knitting. Again, a good distraction because he's using his, he's just using his hands. He's not focused on, you know, his competition or his event. He's just focusing on where, I don't know, the stick or needle is going between each move and so. It's so fascinating <coughs> because that, that's completely opposite to what I would have expected the advice to be, what which would be that you'd be, um, you know, keeping limber, doing your stretches, keeping running in that day before rather than actually diverting yourself to a different activity entirely. Well, you've done all the work. You've spent the past year, four years, if it's an Olympic Games, you've spent, yeah, the past year, 11 months just building your body. So you're not going to get any slower. You, you, you can get faster, but you're not going to get any slower. So for you to keep actively moving, you don't have to be doing sessions or last minute sessions. When you come into tapering of the season, that's the favorite, that's my favorite part because that, that'll tell you whether you're in shape or not. And also the sessions get less intense um, and it's just about up here. So what you do mentally um, and how you stimulate that in the days leading up to your event. What an amazing question. Thank you. So we've got time for one more. Oh. I think I saw a hand right at the very back. Is that right? Um, just in terms of your writing process for the book, obviously it covers a lot of difficult subjects. Um, how did you deal with that emotionally? Um, I... I good friends, good family. Um, so I would contact them, um, a group of, group of people, like I mentioned earlier, who kind of helped me, who were always there for me. So I didn't tell that many people I was writing the book um, until I announced it last, last year, summer, maybe just before the Olympic Games. So I had these group of people who helped me since, you know, since I was young, you know, family, friends, teammates, close, close friends. These are the people who I could trust because... <clears throat> some of the information in the book I hadn't told anyone and I hadn't told them at that point but I told them like there was things that I'd experienced and um, you know they, they were just kind of always there for me so whether it was something heavy I just needed to kind of offload or whether it was um, something lighthearted, or having to reminisce a good moment with my friends like you know not going to any student nights when I was in uni which is ironic because I'm at university um, but then instead, missing training to go catch a, tr catch a train to go to London and go and see Jamaica Quine concert at a private event. Like, what's all that about? Who do I think I am? But stuff like that was fun. Um, and, and yeah, just reminiscing about a whole load of things. There was actually a lot of things, not a lot, but there's a few things I wanted to keep in the book. But I just ran out of so much space and my publishers were just like, okay, there's not enough room. <laughs> there's not enough room. How about my hidden race part two? I'm like, I don't, I hope not. I don't want to go through all that again. I don't want to go, maybe the lighthearted, hopefully the next, I don't know. What, how often do people update their autobios? Every 10 years, 20 years? I think uh, you were talking about Rylan earlier on. Hasn't he done a number of oh, them yeah, already? That's, his is 10. Yeah. His one's 10, but I don't know. If something exciting has happened, I don't know. Like a, we'll give it 10 years and we'll see what you've achieved by then. <sighs> okay, <laughs> all right. We'll hold yeah, you to Hopefully, that. yeah, we'll see. Thank you so much. Um, right, so we've come to the end of the time that we've been able to give it um, to questions to Anika, but we're going to have a few closing words from Mark Allenson. This is our Pro Vice Chancellor for External Relations. Over to you, Mark. At times, certainly somebody like me, and sometimes it's even a despairing read. It's been so important to hear you share some of that uh, uh, today, how your journey exposes and explores the realities of growing up as a black girl in sometimes a less than accepting community and achieving the ultimate uh, 
rewards of a, an elite athlete. Uh, and I've been struck that the book and your talk, though, does contain very stark contrasts. Um, there is the bigotry, there's the unbelievable corporate and institutional greed, uh, there's shocking brutality of racial abuse and sexual assault, and even the contemplation of suicide. However, in sharp positive contrast to that, the love and the support and the pride of your family comes across, the values they imbued of persistence, of hard work and achievement, even to the love of mention of aunties in Wavertree and the comforting food of jollof rice and pepper soup. Sounds very formidable to me, um, but uh, it's all there. And there are the coaches who believed in you, not necessarily for personal gain uh, or even money, but because they really believed you could achieve and wanted you to succeed. And the friends in the sport who cared and really understood when a mere mortals like me and all of us here really could not understand what you were going through. There's one particular phrase in the book, though, that stayed with me. Uh, when facing challenge, injustice, abuse, and worse, is that you say, bend, don't break. They can twist and turn me, but never break me. And that's a very powerful and empowering attitude to hold, and I think to pass on to others. Your journey is clearly very personal, uh, it's honest, it's exposing, and it's powerfully grounded in your reality as a black female athlete, but delivered with a Scouse girl edge, which really comes through in the book, and that's great. You are an inspiration and a role model to all aspiring athletes, and particularly young black females, but you also inspire others, provide insight and understanding, and quite frankly, vitally, for people like me. Um, the values you display are in raw sight against unbelievable challenge, sacrifice and marginal odds, and it is truly remarkable. Uh, and you touch the lives of many uh, for the better. And I think we, uh, certainly your family, and I know your father will be very proud of you. So Annika, on behalf of Edge Hill University, thank you for coming uh, and sharing your journey and life experience with us today. Annika Anora. Thank you.